Today's Bible reading comes from 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17, Hebrews 4 verses 12, and Matthew 5 verses 18. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Hebrews 4 verses 12. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Matthew 5 verses 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Now every day we are faced with a million uh, small decisions and throughout our lives we face a bunch of uh, quite large decisions too, you know. We need to think about what uh, school we want our children to go to, what career path we should pursue. Right now the year 12s are writing their exams and so uh, after that presumably many of them will go to university. What, what course do I enrol in? We need to think about things like what suburb should I live in, uh, whether I should remain single, whether I should get married, if so, whom should I marry, how many children should we have and how far apart should they be, should I accept this job offer from this company or that one, or should I stay where I am, uh, you know, should I accept the promotion or not. We're faced with a million and one decisions in life and almost none of them are addressed in Scripture. The Bible doesn't have a very convenient chapter called How to Decide What Job Offer to Accept, where you can go and look up, you know, the book of Life Hacks, chapter 7, verse 13, and figure out how to assess a potential spouse. So what's the point then of this book, if it's not going to be useful in all of these everyday life decisions? What's the point of a holy book that doesn't answer these questions? Well, the Bible doesn't teach us these things because it is a book with a specific purpose. It is never given as a a kind of manual for life, although it is a manual for life. It's also not written so that we can figure out, you know, which marriage partner we should choose, although it does have a lot to say about it. Instead, the Bible is written to reveal to us who God is and who we are and how our relationship with him works. It is written to teach us about how our relationship with God was broken, how Jesus fixed that, and then what we should do about that. And as it tells this story, we are invited to find our place within that story. And because we're part of that story, because we're part of uh, the story that the Bible is telling, it does have very powerful and significant things to say to us about how we should make our decisions. We can lean on it and understand it, and it does guide how we make decisions, even though it may not specifically say, this is what you should do in this circumstance. And so today we're continuing through our journey uh, through the Belgic Confession. And we're, we're, uh, this is one of our Reformed Confessions, one of our doctrinal standards we call them and so uh, it's it's this kind of a summary of what we believe and articles 3 through to 7 deal with what we believe about the Bible and we're going to be uh, focusing on that whole section today now it's helpful to understand that there are only 36 uh, I think maybe even articles in the Belgic Confession so uh, quite a significant portion of this document is relating to Scripture to the Bible, its place in our lives, what we believe about it. Now again, the confessions are good summaries of Scripture, but they're not Scripture. And so we're not going to read all seven of those. Uh, That would be boring. But um, it does teach us about what goes into Scripture. And so just briefly, this is what our confession actually, uh, what these articles talk about. So Article 3 tells us that the Holy Spirit moved people to write the Bible. So uh, it it is clear that Scripture 
uh, was in human hands. Human hands wrote scripture. God didn't just zap them into existence. It's not some golden book that someone found in, uh, you know, in, in a field somewhere. It is a holy scripture that the Holy Spirit caused people to write. Article 4 tells us which books are to be in our Bible. So the reason we have the books we have in the Bible and, uh, and not other books in the Bible is because the church, after tremendous amounts of prayer and study, concluded that these are the, the authoritative uh, scriptures for our lives. Article 5 tells us that the Bible has absolute authority over our lives because it is the Word of God. So if the Bible says something is sin, then it is sin. If the Bible tells you that something is good, then it is good. It has absolute authority over our lives. Article 6 tells us that there are actually other good books that were around at the time that this confession was written that were also good but aren't actually scripture. And we call these the apocryphal books. And some, uh, particularly Catholic Bibles, will have a section of the Apocrypha in it. And in fact, this confession, the Belgian Confession says, there are many good things in these stories and whatever, but they are not divinely inspired by God. So the church can certainly read these, they may learn from them, uh, and you know, even accept them insofar as they don't contradict the rest of Scripture, but they are not God's Word to us. So as good as these books may be, even as true as they may be, they don't have the same power and authority over us. And then Article 7 uh, tells us that Scripture is sufficient for everything we need to know about salvation. Now this is important. Because we don't believe that the Bible tells us everything about life. It doesn't tell you which job to accept or which suburb to live in. But it does teach us everything. It is sufficient to teach us about salvation, our place in God's story. And so that's what we're going to be delving into today. And we're going to be particularly doing that via um, that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 passage. Because the Bible is ultimately God's empowered Word, And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, I want to focus on this verse, uh, the, these two verses today, and we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning about thinking about what the Bible says about itself. Now, Paul here is writing to his protege, Timothy. He's been encouraging Timothy, if you read this in context, he's been encouraging Timothy to stick to the truth of the gospel. Now, Timothy has been instructed, he's been taught, he's been trained up, and he was put in the church of Ephesus to be its pastor there, really. And so Paul encourages Timothy in the very difficult context of the church of Ephesus to encourage him to say, keep going. And he says this particularly because there were, there were people coming into the church. They were false teachers or charismatic people or whatever the case may be. They were coming into the church and trying to draw people away from the truth of Scripture. And so Paul writes to Timothy and encourages him and he says, keep going, keep teaching the right stuff. And what is the right stuff? Well, he says, all scripture is inspired by God. So let's break down what he says to Timothy a little bit, bit by bit. First of all, he starts in verse 16 and says, all scripture. All scripture is inspired by God, all of it. That means that there is nothing in our Bibles today that is not from God. And we believe that about passages that teach us about God is love, you know. Love is patient, love is kind, love keeps no record of wrongs. We can, we can hear these words and understand deep within us that they are true and accept that they are the Word of God. We love passages like the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, thankfulness, self-control. We hear that and we think, yes, that makes sense. We like stories like the put on the full armour of God, you know, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of peace and shield of faith and helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and we think, yes, I can get behind that. These are wonderful passages that are clearly inspired by God. And so we can accept that about the easy things. But all Scripture is inspired by God. 
Those passages of deep, exceptional, theological uh, truth and beauty, we think, yes, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And we think, yes, that's so different to how the rest of the world sees salvation and, and interacting with God work. And we think, yes, that makes sense. That's from God. Or passages of great deep wisdom. The tongue, says James, is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. And we think about the words we've spoken and other people have spoken to us and the damage words cause, and we think, yes, I can see how that comes from God. Deep truths. They challenge and they inspire us, and we... It's easy to see how these things come from God that stirs our hearts. And we think, yes, they are clearly part of Scripture. But what about the more difficult passages? The ones that clash with our society's norms. The things that our world tells us are good, that the Bible says are in fact evil or judgment. You know... What about Romans 1, 26, 27? For this reason, rejection of God, for this reason God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same way also left natural relations with women and were inflamed by lust for one another and they committed shameless acts with other men and received their own uh, persons the appropriate penalty for their error. We think that's, that's a bit less easy to accept, perhaps, in our culture. What about this one? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. That's not a popular passage. Or in this world where you can be whatever you want to be, the Bible speaks clearly. Um, you know, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he made them. There's only two genders. That's uncomfortable in today's world. And yet, these are words from God. They may be controversial in today's society, but nevertheless, they are part of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed, are God's word to us. When the little green book says, this is a ball and it's a cube... The Bible says, no, that is a cube. All Scripture. We can check what the world says. Second thing is, it's all Scripture is inspired by God. Now, the word we have here for inspired is this one. It occurs only here in one, uh, 2 Timothy 3. It is theonoustos, right? It is literally um, a, a combination word of God and breathe or spirit. The ESV's translation, which was also in the song, uh, I think is better. It is, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is God breathed. Now, at the time that this was written, in people's minds, there's a really strong connection between a person's breath and their spirit. And we actually still have this kind of idea in our English word, inspired, right? The word inspired means to get the spirit into someone. Uh, it comes from the Latin, but it's the same kind of idea. To be inspired is to get the spirit of something into you. It is to get the spirit or the breath or the essence of something into something else. Now, Scripture has been breathed out by God, or to put it another way, the words have his breath, spirit, essence in them. Now that's a pretty massive claim because it means that the very words of Scripture are empowered by God's Spirit, by God Himself. They're not just words on a page. They are the living, breathing Word of God. And that means that these words don't change over time because God does not change over time. They don't change with the seasons. They don't change with society or culture. They remain the same. Jesus himself says this in that passage we read from Matthew chapter 5. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law 
until these things are accomplished. All scripture is breathed out by God, as God breathed. Now, if that's true, if it is true that scripture is God's unchanging, living, breathing word, well then that means it has total authority over us. It has power over us. It is relevant for our lives in a way that no other book can ever be. The Bible is different and set set apart from every other book in the world. Now, I don't think it is an overstatement to say that God has invested his pneumatos, his, his spirit, into these words. And so when we read Scripture, we're not just reading ancient writings or wisdom from long ago. When we read Scripture, we are encountering God himself in his word. Reading God's word is encountering God. It is in reading his word, in hearing it preached, in sitting under its authority that God communicates to us personally. You know, people often say things like, I wish I could just get a word from God. Well, just pick it up. It's right there. I wish God would speak to me. Well, like it's this thick. He's said a lot. His word shapes us and challenges us and pushes against our culture and pushes against our comfort zones too. And so because Scripture is God-breathed, it means we have to listen to it in a way that is completely different to any other book we need to listen to. If I picked up a medical textbook that tells me I should take this medicine or that medicine, it's probably true, but I have a choice as to whether I listen to that or not. But if I pick up scripture, God's breathed word, and it says that I am to love my enemy, I don't get a choice about that. Not if I'm going to honour God. Not if I'm going to follow in Jesus' footsteps. If I disobey that, I'm not just ignoring medical advice. I'm rejecting the very creator and his creative word and its creative power over my life. All scripture is inspired by God. God breathed. But that's not all Paul says. He says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. Now, what does it mean to be profitable? All scripture is God breathed and profitable. It's an interesting choice of words, isn't it? We usually think of profit in sort of purely financial terms. It's making a gain, getting something more than we had before. But when Paul says Scripture is profitable, he's talking about the benefit, the incredible benefit we gain by engaging with God's Word. So think about the logic here for a moment. He says that all Scripture, every last bit of the Bible, is God-breathed. All Scripture is, has this utterly unique quality about it. And if that's true then whenever we encounter it, we are encountering the living, breathing Word of God Himself. And if that's true, then whenever we encounter Scripture, it's going to be for our good, because it's going to shape us. It's going to give us something that nothing else in all of creation can. It's going to teach us in a way that nothing else can. It is profitable in that sense. But profitable for what? He gives us four things. Profitable for teaching. Scripture teaches us the story of God. It is special revelation. And that's different to what nature teaches us. Nature teaches us that there is a God who is powerful and creative and needs to be worshipped. But Scripture teaches us who this God is. It gives us words that describes God's character, his glory, his love. It tells us the story of humanity. It puts us on the cosmic map, so to speak, and explains how we fit into the story. Scripture teaches us a worldview, a framework for understanding how the world works. 
Scripture shows us that God created us, that he made us special, special, that we are made in his image, that he made us to, uh, to conquer and subdue the earth. He made us to rule and govern the land with justice and, and grace. It teaches us that the world isn't perfect and it teaches us how we fell into sin, how the world was corrupted, how our relationship with God was broken. And then it teaches us that God did something about that, that God sent his son and redeemed the world and through his work on the cross, it shows us that Jesus made, uh, forgave our sins, took our sins on him and, and made us right and righteous again. We get his perfect life. Scripture teaches us that all who trust in Christ are now set right with God and that our deepest issue, our sin, is solved forever for every believer. And Scripture teaches us that we are responsible to respond to this amazing story. We are to live for Jesus and live in a way that makes the world better and transforms us. Scripture should teach, it teaches us that Jesus will come again and that the world will ultimately be made right and it gives us a purpose in the meantime while we wait. It tells us that we are to make disciples until that time where we can live with Jesus in a renewed paradise. Scripture teaches us a lot. It's profitable for giving us the whole story of God and where we fit in it. But it's also profitable for teaching and rebuking. Now, we don't like to be rebuked, but rebuking is an essential part of growth. You see, the Word of God has this way of shining a light on our hearts, doesn't it? Exposing the things that don't belong there. It shows up our pride and selfishness, our bitterness, whatever other sins we have. And the reason it does this is because of what Hebrews 4.12 says. The word of God is, uh, is living and effective and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture judges us and our intentions. And because it is alive and God-breathed, it sees and exposes us and rebukes us. It is like that friend who loves you enough to tell you you are heading in the wrong direction. The Bible doesn't leave us in this comfortable space. It says, no, it challenges us in a way that is ultimately for our benefit. And if you are in a church or, in a, or listen to Christian podcasts or read Christian devotionals that only ever affirm you and agree with you and re-establish what you already believe and never rebukes you for your sin, then you know that at best parts of Scripture are being avoided. At best. And at worst, the Word of God has been twisted and has been robbed of its power to rebuke. Scripture is like a loving friend who will rebuke you for doing wrong. One of the most uh, formative moments in my theological study was the time when I was uh, supposed to prepare a sermon for evaluation. And so after we preached this before the class, we would sit in the office of uh, the preaching lecturer and he gives you a private feedback lesson. Yay. Um, and he sat down and he gently rebuked me for not doing my work properly. And he was right. He cared and loved for me enough and he cared about the church enough to point out my mistakes. And I hope that that has been helpful to the church ever since. And the great irony which is not lost on me as I speak this is that the passage I had to prepare for that sermon was this passage. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Rebuke is good, friends, when Scripture does it. But it doesn't just rebuke us. It also corrects us. 
All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, and correcting. Correction is different from a rebuke. A rebuke says, this is what you're doing wrong. Correction says, this is how you should do it instead. It teaches you what is right. God loves us, not, and he just doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to show us in the right direction. He doesn't just say, you're doing it wrong. No, he shows us a better way. He shows us how we might honor him, love our neighbor, love ourselves, and so on. So it corrects our behavior. It gives us guidelines and commandments. And that's a good thing. And it does this with a purpose. And I think it's worth reading this whole passage together. All scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God does these things because he wants to make us perfect. The word there for complete is finished, like a puzzle, you know. All the pieces find its place and it is perfect, complete when it is done. Because we encounter God and his God-breathed word when we read it and we are corrected and trained and rebuked by it, we are being formed by God every time we come into contact with his words. And he is shaping us to be more and more like Christ. Just like an athlete trains day by day to be stronger and more skilled and so on, all of us need training in godliness. And that training is to come from Scripture. So Scripture shapes our character, our values, our actions. It equips us. It it gives us everything we need to do the good that God has called us to do. And so when Paul says that all Scripture is profitable... He is telling us that the Bible is not a book that you pick up and read when you like it and you just put it down and that's all it is. The Bible is actually a book that we pick up and as we read it, it reads us. It knows us as we are because God knows us as we are. And this book challenges us to change. And it ultimately transforms us if we obey it. And if all of that is true, then my challenge to you today is why would you not want to read it? Why would we not want to make this part of our daily rhythm? Why would we not want to seek God's wisdom and comfort and direction as we engage with his word? Why wouldn't we want to be taught and rebuked and corrected and trained in righteousness? Why would we not want for God to breathe his God-breathed word out on us? Why would we not want God's spirit to breathe life into us as we read his God-breathed word? Something to consider. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word, for this special revelation that has this authority over us, that teaches us, that rebukes us, that corrects us, that trains us in righteousness so that we may be complete, equipped with every good work, every good thing to do the work you've given us. Well, thank you that you love us enough not to just leave us where we are, but that you are committed to us in a way that shapes us and forms us. We thank you for that. At the same time, we confess that it is often hard to make the time to engage in your God-breathed word well and diligently. We pray that you will give our hearts the right attitude and the right priority in this way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.